Sana Beach. Good morning again to everybody. I know it's still early in the morning for all those who have been participating yesterday evening in the opening events. We had a wonderful concert lineup downstairs in the Gleishalle and the train hall of the Post City premises here. And many people were also partying late afterwards. But I think nevertheless, we are going uh, to start with our big theme symposium. It is a kind of tradition for the Ars Electronica Festival to have an annual theme and to put this theme out as a kind of challenge to the artists to see what kind of uh, projects, ideas they come up with to respond to this theme. But of course, a theme is there to be elaborated and uh, discussed in symposia conferences and lectures. Actually, the symposia lecture conference program of the festival is really a very large one. We have many also smaller conferences, panels, special interest groups, meetings. So if you are the type of visitor who likes to sit and listen, we have plenty of this for you. And I'm sure we have a really very interesting program together for this year. The theme, Ars Electronica, the theme of Ars Electronica this year, uh, Era, the Art of Imperfection. At the beginning, we were particularly interested, so to say, in the phenomenology of Era. I mean, me, myself, coming also from engineering, I was very excited by this idea to compare Era as a strategy of innovation, Era as an important fact in human life and social life, of course, also with issues like cybernetics. I think at the beginning of all this uh, electronic digital revolution, there's actually this idea of this cybernetic circle where you have something that you want to achieve, you compare it with the reality, and then you develop a system, a cycle that adjusts these two things so that you can optimize the result. And I think what is very nice and great for engineering, maybe also for business processes, to have an optimization, to have an optimum, to have a norm, to get what you expect, is probably for society, for culture, and nowadays for our big holy grail, the innovation, one of the most terrible things that can happen. Because the only thing that happens when things become perfect is that they stall. Perfection means the end of development, because why should you develop anything if it would be perfect? So this whole idea, and even, for example, looking at quantum physics, where the error gets also a completely new dimension that uh, I think much more so in the future than already will also influence uh, the ideas and the thinking of our philosophers when we are finally, maybe in the future, more and more growing into a society, into humans that are really capable to think about what quantum physics, for example, really could mean for the way how we see the world, how we see ourselves. But the more we went into this festival development, the more the second side of ERA came up. Because ERA, as you all know, is... It's just an error. A failure is something different already. Error is just that what you expected didn't happen. So it's just a deviation from the norm, the deviation from what is expected. But of course, the failures became more and more present. And while we were developing the festival, was this uh, scandal with Facebook and uh, uh, Cambridge Analytics and uh, Mark Zuckerberg appearing uh, in front of the US Senate and the Congress. And so more and more, a very important part of this festival planning became the question, what went wrong with our digital revolution? What are the errors that we were running after? Why became this dream of freedom a nightmare of control, surveillance, and exploitation. And so the whole festival, whether it's the conferences today and on Sunday, and also the two major exhibitions that we have here in the first level and in the, in the basement level, they oscillate between these two extreme poles of the era, 
the failure and the mistake on the one side, but of course on the other side also the fake, the falsification. And I think it's a very important topic as well to look at this. So this was also the guideline for us to look for really outstanding and interesting speakers and contribu uh, contributors for this um, symposium here. And now I have spent about uh, my time that is always reserved for me to give latecomers the chance to come before we really start. And I can finish my deliberations and introduce you to Barbara von Redbach. Barbara, thank you very much for coming. Barbara <laughs> will be the moderator for this day's uh, conference. An artist and educator, she works at the Art University in Linz. And she is also very interested in this topic and has done a lot of work around uh, these uh, topics and this area of these topics. And without any further ado, please take over the chair of this conference. Well, thank you, Gerrit. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Do you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Error, failing. We as designers have this. We do trial and error sessions. I come from a design background and trial and error, there's always failing. And then we start again, we try again. We do it differently. We test, we adjust, we make it better. So error is an interesting concept for me because I use it in my daily work with my students in projects. So I think also here at Electronica, people are very interested and can relate to this topic. When I look in your faces, I think there's many people coming also from design and error has relevance in our life, of course. What we don't do or what we don't like to do is actually talk about these errors. Trial and error in design, I said. It means we are talking about the success then, the end product, finished version. But maybe, as Thomas Macho yesterday said, it would also be interesting to investigate in this failing. Maybe it's interesting to look at these failures, these little mistakes, and what stories they do tell. And today, we want to investigate a bit into these failures, into mistakes, into errors, and also into fragile concepts of machines and of humans. And we have a great panel of speakers. They sit behind me. <laughs> I just have to get used to the perspective, but you can see them very soon. And I think we are waiting for them to be on stage to discuss these concepts. Our speakers will take a closer look at failures and the potential, the Maybe there's solutions in failing too. So what could the potential be in the cracks of the smooth surface of our machines? Or do we have to work in a different way, total different way than we did before to cooperate with machines? Perfect machines, perfect humans. How does it work? Do our machines have to change? Do they have to become more social, do they to have to adapt? My name is Barbara von Rechbach. I welcome you to the session now. And we are going on a quest today to find some answers to these questions. So let me introduce you to our first speakers. Anna Echterhölter and Andreas Wolfsteiner. They will talk about avoidable delay. Avoidable delay measuring error in practices. Anna is a professor of history of science at the University of Vienna. And she also talked in Berlin at the Technical University of Berlin, at the Humboldt University of Berlin. She had fellowships, amongst others, Max Planck Institute, for the history of science in Berlin, Goldsmiths College, London, etc. And Anna is very interested in asymmetric infrastructures, the history of measurement, which is connected to our subject with error and fragile 
here today, of course. Andreas teaches at the University of Vienna, the Department for Theatre, Film and Media Studies. And he was a visiting professor at the Hermann von Helmholtz Center for Technology for Cultural Techniques at the Humboldt University in Berlin and also working at the University of Hildesheim. Andreas, interest, Andreas is interested in the theory and history of interfaces. He published a book about the visibility of machines, handling scenarios, where he was discussing error scenarios in political and economical and military contexts and how these can be connected to theater practice, to theater and performance practice. So it's also a close look at errors and nooks and mistakes. So please welcome our two speakers, Anna Echterhölter and Andreas Wolfsteiner. Please come to the stage. Hey. Great to have you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. Thank you so much for the nice introduction, Barbara. I would say good morning, but I've seen some of you just having a fully-fledged lunch, so I expect uh, our audience to be from all kinds of different time zones. Welcome, anyhow. It was about 11 years ago when we both met in a research unit called the Transformations of Chronology. It was about time and measurement, comparing Hebrew and African calendar variations and time deviations, we were faced with a sudden deep dive into the realm of correction, errors, and all kinds of temporal disinformation. Because um, it is no surprise, time reckoning systems are hugely out of sync there in history. They do not fit, um, just as metric systems and currency systems are not as commensurable as we are used to nowadays. We soon came across the question in how far systematic errors and non-systematic errors in a wide range of work practices must be classified as a crucial part of productive agency. And this is uh, with John Burry, uh, he put it in 1920 in his publication on the idea of progress, for example. So in the next 15 minutes, we are going to show how far errors, measurement, and human bodies practices become increasingly entangled, how errors shape the corporal sphere, and how in return, technological, animal, and corporate bodies are subject to a hygiene of error. Well, in this conference, many uh, advanced contributions will deal with the state of current affairs or future projects, probably. We aim to historicize one particular strand and this is, of course, about data. Yeah? Especially those data produced in measurement of human bodies, motions, and practices. And we thought it very fitting, too, to open today's discussion on the art of error with two examples of wrong measurements. So what we're going to do um, is to show you four takes, and these four takes on thurblings, goats, on sin and pain, and on error scenarios um, are connected in that, that there's just one thing is off. It's not a standard measurement. And something is imperfect, imprecise, overzealous, or even catastrophic about them. Um, and this is all in the line of a history of data. So although it appears that machines and other technological entities nowadays become more and more intimate and human, we think that the root directories of our society at the same time become increasingly more um, relying on, on data measurement and um, on, on more rigid cores. So that's, that's the surface and core uh, lines that we're going to try to explore in these four takes. During the First World War, at the end of 1915, Frank Bunker Gilbreth published an article titled Motion Study for the Crippled Soldier in the journal of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. Therein, he defines work processes as, quote, 
cycle of decisions and motions arranged in varying sequences. End of quote. According to the analysis, a total of 16 elementary types, wait a little more, called Ferblicks can be found. Ferblicks is just the name Gilbreth phonetically in reverse. Among tasks like search, find, select, grasp, position, assemble, basic practical error can be found as avoidable delay. You can see it, it's this little guy here lying down on his back. This last category of movement stands out since it signifies the unforeseen absence of motion, the outright denial to carry on. It is a symbol of halt, of interception, and exhaustion. It seems to be more critical compared to the others. The category clearly comprises the employer's perspective, whose sole objective is an optimum efficiency of motion. But how long a time span? Let's take a quick look at an error measurement setting. The Gilbreths tried out in the year 1916. The image you see depicts then famous Margaret Benedict Owen, the world's fastest typist. In a typing convention in 1916, she reached a new record. In an hour long contest, she would write a total of 7,925 words, which sums up to 18 standard pages. And that's equal to 125 words a minute on an Underwood machine. And there's an interesting part. The net words after deducting error were 7,495 words. That's a total of 430 false words. And that's pretty exactly, if you want to imagine it, one norm page out of 18 pages total. The error rate of Margaret Benedict Owen accounts with a clear 0.054%. I read that out for you. The main thing is, it's interesting because that's a density that you would expect in better tested software nowadays. The main thing is that Owen was on the one hand coached by another tailorist called Charles E. Smith, and on the other hand underwent error observations within the experimental setting of Gilbreth in order to analyze, predict, and prevent error in her emotional cycle of typing. Gilbreth, in one of his analytic movies even claims to have changed the arrangement of the keys on the machine in order to prevent avoidable delay due to a defective motion cycle on the part of Margaret Owen. Margaret Owen comments on her writing experience as follows. For a year, I diligently copied from morning till night. My fingers became more supple, my nerves more settled, my method more daring. It was at this time that I discovered I wrote mechanically. Page after page, I copied, my fingers virtually reading the copy mechanically. The minute I took place before my typewriter, I forgot the crowd and the cheering. If ever an inanimate object came to life, it was my machine." End of quote. In this concrete, thirblick arrangement we see Margaret Owen set it in, we observe the beginnings of an intrusion, an intrusion of the data sphere into manual and behavioral patterns. This marks the advent of a post-Fordist 
climate. An emphasis on data collection about single motions of the head, the hand, and finally, the mind. The data collected in the setting that shows Margaret Owen has today become a commodity. No longer are online products in the focus of economic assessment. Since data about individuals has become a market in itself, a stage that could be qualified as data capitalism, as described by Sarah Myers West, in the way that Thurblicks form an alphabet for the possible practices of a worker, this particular material, the information about motion patterns, turns into the current production and currency. I give you a counter image. John Menard Keynes once uh, mentioned a case from Uganda, and he did so in his treatise on money. His friend in Uganda, he was a colonial official, and reportedly he was often very bored. Bored by the tedious duties of solving disputes over the quality of animal bodies. Apparently, requests of conflicting parties often urged him to decide upon the quality of the standard goat. Everything of value was measured against a goat standard, which was a very important uh, animal for the farming uh, landscape there. Sometimes goats themselves would change the proprietor, sometimes it was just the unit. Three goats, I give you the value of three goats on this and that day. Goats performed typical monetary functions, and such measures of value, um, such as measure of value or unit of account. And it is by no means an exception, of course, um, for those of you who like the agrarian world of Homer, cattle here is very, very often used to express value. In some regions of Africa, we even have testimony to units of account that are measured in units of slaves. And uh, from here in the Alps to the North Sea, chicken had to be given on a particular dates to the authorities as dues. And uh, not every animal, of course, was acceptable because these bodies differ. And in order to ascertain that you did not have to deal with a glitchy chicken, there was a test. The animals given had to be capable of flying on a barrel. They had uh, to be motorically fit, in a way. And these quarrels in Uganda, or as well the performance tests for birds, indicate the problem. The bodies of these valuable animals did, of course, not form an exact scale, an exact value scale, and this is um, the point of this uh, take. They led to negotiations, obviously. They led to negotiations about the error in measurement, and this is, of course, completely different from today's world, where everything's smooth, commensurable. Sometimes, you know, there are errors, but in, in, in principle, these scales and these units and these metric systems, they're all in place. So it's easy to say what's wrong in this take. Um, there's an absence of a metric infrastructure. We cannot value um, monetary transactions numerically, precisely, right? So we have to use these animal bodies. And of course, um, animal bodies here are just an approximate way of doing things, but a thing that is like globally testified to. Um, just to step back even further, you know, if we're talking about the history of data and we want to start thinking about where did quantification start? Where did it sort of begin? Um, many people point to sin and pain nowadays. This connection of quantification and bodies can be taken to a criminal extreme. In the early Middle Ages, the metric order of the Roman Empire was in decline and decay. Coins became a local affair if they circulated at all. But remarkably, the legal codes that were compiled from the 9th century onwards here in Europe testify to a very widespread system. They contained 
veritable catalogs of degrees in which a body was hurt. They did so with quite stunning detail. Can the eye still hold a tear? Does a healed foot drag through the dew in the morning? These legal compilations produce quite stable quantifications for pain and injury and even death. What is more, they measure every harm done against an expressed value and an exactly expressed value. So here the precision comes in. Um, for example, the most famous equivalent, 200 solidi for the murder of a free man. Of course, killing women or unfree persons uh, could be appeased by a lesser sum of blood money. David Greber's reading of the Irish blood money catalogues emphasizes the important role, rank, social strata, played in these listings. And lately, there's been a lot of discussion about these errors and criminals in the criminal sense and their influence on the development of value scales. James Aho, for example, analyzes confession and measuring the sin, everyday sins, as a subtly standardized practice, at least in Catholic Church. In the same way, Karl Polanyi suggests, with a Buddhist example, that scales for measuring develop out of the quantification out of moral states of shame. I quote, punishment approximates payment when the process of riddance of guilt is quantified. So it's not the guilt itself, it's getting rid of it. So there's this complex of debt and shame um, that has to be sort of managed by sin and um, prayer, obviously. Stable systems are derived from harmed bodies, criminal injustice, and tormented minds. So that was my take. Next step. Can you hear me? In the next step, we're going to skip about 1,000 years and outline what coping with error looked like in the second half of the 20th century. In order to ensure the maximum of error cancellation and delay avoidance, the practice of scenario analysis emerges. At the beginning of the Cold War, around the 1950s. The use of this practice at that time is underscored as a part of the strategic plans after the onset of the Korean War. Scenario analysis evolved to be a well-established approach, an approach that shaped our understanding of Erinus' future developments and cultural malfunctioning like no other. At the end of the 1960s, scenario planning becomes a common practice in the arising simulation economy for example, in national insurance companies, in climate research, in market and structural analysis, in ergonomics, in organizational, as well as management theory. As a crude mixture of improvisational gaming, role play, and raw statistical analysis carried out by the infamous Rand Corporation, they develop a tool to foresee possible futures, more or less precisely, without any imperfections. A group of consultants the press dubbed the Megadeth intellectuals, defined scenarios, and that's very similar to Gilbert's motion cycle, and I quote him, hypothetical sequences of events constructed for a purpose of focusing attention on causal processes and decision points for preventing, diverting, or facilitating possible errors, end of quote. This snippet is taken from the book The Year 2000, a framework for speculation on the next 33 years, written by Herman Cain and Arthur J. Wiener in 1967. As Louis Menon put it, in, put it in his analysis of Herman Cain and the nuclear war, the margins of error in futurist writings can be staggering. And indeed, not seldomly will you find phrases preferably hidden in footnotes that sound like this, and I quote Cain, given the uncertainties the problem could conceivably be five times or worse, end of quote. Despite these breathtaking uncertainties, scenarios deliver robust results concerning a thinking of the unthinkable, as Cain put it. Although 50%, roughly, 
of the predictions are wrong. But they do preconceive of achievements like home computers, artificial organs and limbs, pages, and quote, perhaps even two-way pocket phones, end of quote. On the other hand, the year 2000 came, and still there were no noiseless helicopters instead of cab cars, no artificial moons in the sky to illuminate the cities. And concerning labor, well, there's still no 13-week vacation, is there? In the article, scenario, uncharted waters ahead, 1985, Pierre Wack, an official of Royal Dutch Shell, who had risen to fame when he predicted the oil crisis of 1973 via scenario planning, puts it like this, and I quote him. Since the early 1970s, however, forecasting errors have become more frequent and occasionally of dramatic and unprecedented magnitude. They are usually constructed on the assumption that tomorrow's world will be much like today. They often work because the world does not change. But sooner or later, will fail when they are needed most. End of quote. Good, so why these four worlds of quantification? Why did we pick these examples, these particular bodies, these particular measurements? <coughs> For one, we claim that it's important to remember how strongly bodies are entangled with this new, newly developing data infrastructures and metric infrastructures, these metric ecologies that we're immersed in. The Thurblick, the diligent Mrs. Owen and her typewriting machine, uh, was the best example for eradicating error and how that um, affli afflicted her. Data interfere with the man-machine behavior, and um, this model of Mrs. Owen may become very ubiquitous. The goat showed the opposite. We just wanted to remind everybody that there was times where this precision wasn't, was not available. So it's some kind of failure of precise infrastructure. It's not readily uh, measurable. And these times, bodies become the standards or serve as value standards themselves. With sin and pain, we wanted to show that these quantifications, people are discussing that these quantifications may emerge from sin and pain and these uh, blood money catalogs. And with the error scenarios, we wanted to, to show that it's not statistics. When they're real great problems, wars, catastrophes, and the prediction of those is not left to statisticians, but these mixed media practices of scenarios where the body or role play comes in again. Just as earlier organizational theory maintained that humans become the environment of practices, we now have to face situations where we may become environmental or marginal to data streams and data circulation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Andreas. Very interesting tour into the history of measurements. I mean, it said to err is human, but we have to eliminate mistakes, we have to eliminate these mistakes and errors to work. We will have the discussion later after our other two speakers. I wrote down quite a bit. I think it's interesting also for our audience. So thanks a lot. For our next speaker, I would like to ask you, how do you feel now? How do you feel today, this morning? Sitting comfortable? <laughs> yeah, the chairs are not so good, but they're quite better than normal conference chairs, so my back is okay, actually, this morning. How about you? <laughs> Can you see me? <laughs> I'm a bit short-sighted, so I see the first row, and then it's a bit blurry, but yeah. Humans have many mistakes. Our bodies are not perfect, and that's why we have all these extensions, right? 
But are we not evolution's crown, the greatest achievement? Why are our bodies full with failures? And could it also be a chance to work with these failures? Could our failures be assets, maybe? This is a topic our next speaker will discuss. Nathan H. Lenz. He will talk about human error, evolutionary glitches in the human body. But also, on a more optimistic note, why our flaws can be assets too. Nathan is professor for biology, molecular biology at John Jay College at CUNY, that's the City University of New York. So he comes from the facts. I'm a designer, I'm a storyteller, I can tell you stories about it, but he's actually the researcher doing molecular biology stem research. He maintains also a very interesting blog, the, the Human Evolution blog, and a podcast series, The Work of Humans, and he has published two books. The latest is Human Error, a panorama of our glitches, and it's very interesting to see this. And maybe, Nathan, you can tell us also about yeah, our backs and chairs, and why this doesn't fit together so well, and we always have back problems. So, please welcome Nathan H. Lenz with me. Happy to have you here, Nathan. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know if, is this on? I guess yeah, it, it is. is. <laughs> it's this one. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak to you today about my favorite topic, the topic that I know more about possibly than everyone else, and that is imperfection. And in fact, um, when my mother found out that I was writing a book all about human flaws and imperfections, she told me, finally, something you know a lot about. And I put that as the dedication page of the book, which explains a lot about the relationship I have with my mother. But it's, it's wonderful to be here today to talk about imperfection and to hopefully uh, shed new light and a, and a new way of looking at imperfection as not the opposite of perfection. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. First of all, in biology, there's no such thing as perfection. Just the idea that any living thing could be perfect um, just simply doesn't make any sense. Because if you do a thought experiment and imagine a perfect organism that escaped every predator, defeated every disease, found all of its food, how long could it be like that before it ate all the food and the planet would be nothing but that thing uh, and then suddenly it would find itself not so perfect anymore? And um, I read an interesting thing in the, in the bulletin, in, in the program for this conference that talked about when a mistake is made, how do you know if that is the beginning of a new innovation or if it's just a goof up? How do you know if you're not really starting something brand new? And the reason why I love that so much and why it spoke to me is because that's exactly how this works in biology. Because every single bit of diversity in life Every single innovation, every single new thing about everything begins as a mutation. And many of you know what mutations are, but in case you don't, there are essentially errors in our DNA code, in our DNA uh, genetic material. And those errors can come about in a number of ways, but the most common way is a copying error, truly a mistake. But thank God for those mistakes because we wouldn't be anything more than anaerobic bacteria um, if it weren't for them. Everything good about us, all of our greatness, all of our innovation comes from these little tiny mistakes that then in the course of geologic time accumulate uh, into everything we see on this planet. And so, and there's a lesson there I think for our political times that we're living in right now. 
Diversity is good, and it always has been. Um, it's the source of all of our greatness and all of our strength. Um, but the story doesn't end there. Uh, and in fact, it's just the beginning of this story, uh, at least the story of, of my book, Human Errors. Uh, we do actually have a body that has flaws in it, that has glitches. And in order to talk about those, I have to somewhat define what an error or a glitch is in this context. Um, because I don't want us to get tripped up into a semantic debate. Um, and what I define flaws or quirks or glitches or peccadillos, whatever word you want to use, how I define them is simply suboptimal function or suboptimal structure such that calls out for an explanation. So if it makes you scratch your head and say, who would design it that way that basically fits my criteria? So that's the, in the inclusion criteria here is simply that which requires an explanation, that which a designer would never make. Now, I'm well aware that opinions can vary on that topic in the human body, and that it may be that we just simply don't know enough about some of these things. I'm painfully aware of that because this often explodes into very public debates. Um, and any of you who follow me on Twitter will find uh, when I have a couple of extra hours that I wish I could later take back, I get into these arguments with people about what is a flaw and what is a mistake. Um, but I'll stick with my very simple crude definition, that which requires an explanation. So in my book and, and in all of my writings, I, I found that the categories, uh, that there are three categories that the different flaws and quirks and errors that we have tend to fall into. Um, and the first of those categories is called mismatch. And the concept of mismatch is simply that we are now living in a world that is very different than the world that we evolved in. And we're using our bodies in very different ways than we used to, than we did for millions of years before that. So on that first mark, some people have a concern or, or an issue with what I define as flaws because it's just simply we're using our body uh, for a different purpose than it now was. Basically, another way to see it is cultural evolution has outpaced biological evolution, all right, and we now suffer a bit because of that. And just to let you all know, everybody in this room except me and a few back there are sitting in a very mismatched posture, right? Chairs were not part of our evolutionary past. We find them very comfortable. We sit in them all day, and you pay a price for doing that because your body was not meant to sit in a chair. More about that another day. Um, but uh, another example of a mismatch, in case you're curious, I I'm sitting out here and I'm seeing a lot of corrective lenses, right? A lot of eyeglasses. Um, and that's a, probably an understatement because some of you are wearing contact lenses and others of you, like me, have had lasers shot in your eye and had your eyes fixed. But the point is, is that myopia is a, it, it, the inability to see at distance is a scourge on humanity. About 40% of the population of Europe and North America um, require corrective lenses to see at distance, and that number goes up to about 75% in Asia. So in other words, most of the planet has poor vision. Most of the individuals have poor vision. That's some bad design right there. And imagine, if you will, an eagle or a hawk that can't see very well at distance. How long do you think that eagle would survive? Not very long, the eagle would starve and take his bad eyes with him. Um, so how are we allowed to have this very poor vision? Well, there's two answers to this, one biological and one cultural. The biological one is simply that we don't need to have perfect vision in order to survive. And that's a good thing, right? It's a good thing we're not eagles. Because what it says about us culturally is that there's many different ways that an individual can contribute and be successful. Maybe you're not the best hunter, you could be a homesteader. You could be a gatherer. You could be a shaman, all right? In fact, some of the most important people in our cultural group are those that share their wisdom. Generally, the, the elderly, the, the oldest uh, members of our population are a reservoir of wisdom. And the fact that our eyes don't have to be perfect, in my view, is the happy story. Aren't you glad your body doesn't have to be perfect in order to be alive and thrive and contribute to society? Um, and that's just not true for a lot of animals, so it's a good thing. 
Why is this a mismatch flaw, though? That seems like the eyes just built wrong if we're, so many of us uh, can't see well. Well, what we found in the last 10 years is that the rate of myopia is almost directly correlated with how much time you spent indoors as a child. So the more time you spent indoors, the greater the odds are that you need corrective lenses as you get older, as you, as you uh, enter adolescence. Because that's when this typically hits, is in childhood. Because our eyes are still growing and we spend, we're in school, we're in daycare, we spend all our time looking at short distances and as our eyes are growing, they don't grow to the correct length. And so, if you look at hunter-gatherer tribes, for example, their myopia rate is down below 10% because they're outside all of the time. So as we began to live indoors, our eyes didn't start working so well. So that's why, that's that category of flaws, mismatch. Some of the back problems that you are all gonna go home suffering today are the result of mismatch, partially because of how you're sitting right now. Um, sorry to hit you over the head with that yet again. But that's one category of flaws. But one thing that I find interesting is, for each one of our flaws, we have a creative solution. Um, and I use the word creative on purpose because if you look around the room and look at all of these corrective lenses, what have, the, the glasses that you can see, what have we done with that? We've made art out of it. We've made fashion. Eyeglasses are a, a fashion accessory. Many people now, especially if you live in Brooklyn, wear glasses even if they don't need them. Right? Just as a fashion statement, just as iconography in one way or another. So here's a case of a flaw. We never would have invented glasses if our vision, if we had hawk eyes, right? But we have invented glasses, and since we have to have them, let's make them beautiful. So that's, that's part of the human story as well. Another category of uh, flaws are what we call trade-offs or compromises. And this really highlights the limits of evolution, the limits of our anatomy, and the fact that we really, all we have is the body we have at this time, and mutation can simply make tweaks and tugs and little, uh, tiny little changes, uh, and that's the best you can do from one generation to the next. Of course, over time, you can get radical change, but the changes are small. Look at your ankle, for example, or your wrist, right? You have about seven bones sloshing around in your wrist. There's no way an engineer would design a robot that looks anything with, with a joint that looks anything like our wrist or our ankle. But we're stuck with a certain anatomical chassis that all vertebrates have, that all mammals have, that we can only just tweak. And we end up with extra bones and, and uh, bizarre uh, paths for our nerves and uh, all kinds of weird things that have no explanation based on design. They simply are the result of evolution's meandering path. And these little tweaks and tugs are the, are the best that evolution can do. Um, and I have lots of uh, fun examples of that uh, that I could share with you. And then there's some errors and imperfections in our body that are just nothing more than bad luck. Um, for example, we have a gene, well, what's left of a gene, called GULO, uh, which is a, a key enzyme. It codes for a key enzyme in vitamin C synthesis. Now, you might be asking, vitamin C synthesis? We can make our own vitamin C? The answer is no, we can't, because the gene's been mutated by pure chance, and, 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 and beyond recognition, beyond function. So you have to have vitamin C in your diet simply for that reason. You can almost make it yourself in your liver cells. You can almost get there, but you have that one gene that's been inactivated. That's unusual in the animal kingdom. Outside of primates, pretty much every other animal makes vitamin C for themselves in their own bodies. It's not a nutrient they need to get from their diet. Any of you have dogs and cats, are you worried about them getting enough citrus fruit? Right? There's zero fruit in their diet, typically, or at least not necessary, because they simply make this stuff for themselves. In fact, humans have an incredibly needy diet, um, as I talk about, because we are so used to having nutrients just served up to us uh, nice and easy, so we don't make them for ourselves anymore. So those are the three categories of errors, and each one of them have, has lots of interesting um, examples and, 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 and things that we can learn from them. And um, in, in my book, I, I categorize them not just by, by their functional categories, but also where and how they occur. And the anatomy is, in many ways, uh, uh, the richest chapter of examples because everyone can sort of poke and prod on their own bodies and find these little flaws uh, and little glitches. And I already talked about your eyes. Um, but there's even, even more than that. Has anybody here, I don't know if they, there's not enough people to have any hands up, but has anybody here ever had a cold? Anyone? Not even one of you? Never had a cold? I imagine a few of you have had a cold before. 
Um, many of you have also probably suffered sinus infections. Anybody here have sinus infections? Well, again, those of you with companion animals, three or four times a year, do you find your dog and cat sniffling, sneezing, coughing, having any of those symptoms? No, what people don't realize is the common cold is, is pretty much a uniquely human problem. And the reason why is we have these huge uh, ca uh, cavities, they're actually small compared to other mammals, but uh, for our anatomy, huge cavities behind our cheekbones called the sinus cavities, the maxillary sinus cavities. And they are supposed to flow with mucus and grab stuff and uh, keep everything nice and clean in terms of the air that you breathe. Well, if you have this nice flowing mucus that's supposed to grab stuff, where would you put the drain that this mucus is supposed to drain down into? If you had any sense whatsoever as a plumber, where would you put the drain? At the bottom. That is not at all what we do. The drain pipe for your largest sinus cavities is located at the top of the chamber, which means you have to work against gravity very hard to get mucus to flow upwards uh, in, in order to keep things healthy. It, that means it does not take much to gum it all up and get it stuck and have a festering pool of mucus, uh, and that's how you get sinus infections in the common cold. Um, that's why sometimes, especially if you have a sinus infection, laying down gives you temporary relief. This weird design is not found in any other mammals. Even our closest relatives, the other apes, have dealt with the problem. And, and by the way, the problem I'm talking about is the reduction of the snout that happened in our ancestry. We reduced our snout, brought our eyes forward, rearranged our face. So we had to do something with these sinus cavities. All of the other apes did a better job rearranging their face than we did. We really got the worst end of this deal. Another funny anatomical quirk that uh, most people find interesting. There's a nerve that leaves your brain and goes to your larynx. Okay, it's called the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Now you might expect it makes a nice easy route out of your brain into your throat, out of the back of your spinal cord, right there into your larynx. But if you thought that, you would be wrong. It turns out this nerve dives deep into your chest, wraps around some blood vessels, and then comes back up into your neck where it finds the larynx. And you'll see on this slide here, there's two nerves that I point out that go to the larynx. One does make the nice, easy, direct route, and the other nerve actually wraps around your aorta. Any chest surgeons are very conscious of this nerve because if they are not careful while performing open heart surgery, you could lose your ability to speak uh, ever again if that nerve gets cut. Funny design, right? That's because it wasn't design. Evolution doesn't work by designs. What happened was, deep in our ancestry, that nerve went from the brain to the gills. So I'm talking about the way back in our, when our ancestors were fish. And that was a straight shot from the, from the brain through what would become the heart to the gills, nice and easy. But then, of course, we developed a neck and a chest and all these things spread out, and that nerve just got tangled up with the aorta, and here it is today. And if you think it's bad for us, Think about giraffes or the brontosaurus. How many meters was that stupid nerve going down into their chest only to come right back up again? So those are some anatomical flaws. We also have flaws in our genome. I already talked about one of them, but it turns out you have as many broken genes as functional genes in your DNA. I don't know if you knew that. They're called pseudogenes. The gulo is, is one pseudogene. You have many others. Um, in addition, you have tons of repetitive, non-functional DNA uh, that for all intents and purposes does nothing, but potentially causes great harm if it's still jumping around your genome. Um, uh, the numbers vary, and there's certainly debates going on about this, but I can confidently say at least half of your DNA has no positive function. It does nothing and potentially causes harm. Um, in addition to the pseudogenes and the repetitive stuff, about 9% of your DNA isn't even yours in a sense, it's viral DNA. It's the carcasses of viral infection, left over from viral infections that our ancestors won, but the remains are kept in our chromosomes and we dutifully copy them and spread them to every cell in our body every single generation. Uh, so our genome is, is uh, just a mess. Again, nothing, showing, showing no signs of design. No, no sane engineer would design our genome that way. I already talked a little bit about our diet. We need vitamin C in our diet, but that's just the beginning. Think about the, the food groups or the food pyramid and all the different food advice you're getting now. It's all bewildering and conflicting. 
Today they're saying we need that. Tomorrow they're going to say, no, no, we were wrong, cut that out. The point is, is that there's some truth to all this. We do need a little bit of this, a little bit of that, not too much this. Make sure you get enough of that. Um, and that's really a uniquely human problem. Look at your pets once again. Premium dog food is lamb and rice. And that's all they eat every day, all day, and they will be perfectly healthy. The koala bear eats eucalyptus leaves every day, all day. And while they might supplement, they don't need to. They can be happy on eucalyptus leaves, right? And eucalyptus leaves are not very nutritious by our standards. And yet they do just fine. So why do we struggle so much with our, our diet? It's because during our deep past, we were evolving in the salad bowl of, southern, of, of sub-Saharan Africa, where lots of nutrients were just simply served up to us right in our diet, so our body got lazy. And that's another important lesson of evolution, that the way that we keep tip-top shape is through the harshness of natural selection. And when you remove the harshness of natural selection, our body gets lazy, and we stop doing these things for ourselves. Um, reproduction, this is another one. We, we have tons of flaws throughout the reproductive process, um, and anybody who suffered with infertility um, has probably contended with this, this bizarre thing. If, if our species should be able to do anything, it should be reproduction, right? Um, but we, we, we suffer there uh, for various reasons as well. And the one that I often like to point out, because it's a good evolutionary compromise, is childbirth. Childbirth is... Una unassisted, unaided childbirth is an incredibly painful and dangerous procedure. In fact, it was probably one of the leading causes of death of both women and infants for a long part of our history. That is also unusual. You don't see that in other apes. In fact, birth, for the most part in, among mammals, isn't, that, isn't even that dramatic of an affair. I've seen videos of gorillas continuing to care for other children and eat while giving birth. Anybody ever seen like a cow give birth? The cow just sort of plops off and walks away and the other cow's just going about its business. It, this is really a human thing to have such a struggle with childbirth. And if you want to know why, it's because of our big old brains, right? Um, if you look at the chimpanzee pelvis and the chimpanzee skull at birth, you'll notice a nice easy fit. The chimpanzee doesn't struggle during the process of parturition uh, of giving birth. If you look at our ancestor from about two and a half million years ago, Lucy, you'll see that fit tightened up quite a bit. Lucy was standing upright, and the, the skull of the infant uh, of the Australopithecus afarensis fits through, fits through the pelvic girdle, but it's not, you know, it's not, it's not too comfortable. But now if we look at a human pelvis, a female pelvis um, at adulthood, and the skull at birth, I see, I see lots of uh, uncomfortable people when they see this. Um, if you're thinking that doesn't fit, then you're, you're on the right track. Uh, basically, what we have here is a trade-off of, of evolution pulling on both ends of the rope. Of the rope excuse me. One, our big brains. One, um, uh, our pelvises that got skinnier so that we could walk upright and have this nice striding gait where we're not bouncing our weight around. And compromises, trade-offs, that's the story of evolution. Now, how do, we, how do we deal with this particular compromise? Well, one thing we do is we're born way, way, way too early. So before the brain got any bigger, we push them out. Uh, and our, we're just not ready. Most, most mammals um, are born and then walk around and start going off the, on their own. A horse kind of shakes itself off and is off and running. Whereas humans are completely dependent on their parents for about 30 years. Okay, uh, and because I'm getting called on time, I can't give you uh, any more examples, but um, we also have a lot of diseases where our immune system attacks itself and all kinds of funny things that we have a, a, worse, a worse problem than a lot of other animals, um, and uh, sickle cell anemia and, uh, as a defense against malaria. Many of part probably know that story already, but we actually evolved this disease as a way to combat malaria, uh, and it works pretty well when it doesn't kill you of sickle cell anemia. Um, and so this is the story. And, and the last category of flaws, the way, what I'll end my, my presentation on, is the flaws in our mind. And I usually don't have to say too much about that in this particular political moment, because it's pretty clear <laughs> that we're losing our minds <laughs> and giving up on everything that made our civilization great in the first place. But the point is, is that we do have flaws and errors in our brains, in our mind, that psychologists call cognitive biases, that are not just limits. They're not just 
They're not just us not being good enough. We make the same kinds of mistakes over and over and over, even when we should know better. There really is some faulty wiring uh, in our brain. And so what I want to end, end this with is, is why did I write this book all about our flaws? It sounds like such a depressing topic. It, it's not really, because it tells us so much about our past. Our flaws are beautiful. They're also illuminating. One way to find our, out about our, fast, uh, about our past is to dig up fossils and study them. But we also have the marks right in our own body of our past. And all of these flaws are like scars from the great battle of survival. The battles that we won against a lot of odds. And now, given those flaws in our minds, we have a big question to ask is, is are our big brains going to be the, the, the best thing we ever did, the pinnacle of creation, or is it going to be our biggest flaw as of right now in the next 50 or 60 years? I could see it going either way. Thank you so much uh, for your time and attention, and enjoy the rest of the festival. Thank you, Nathan. <laughs> I don't know if it answered all our questions about our body flaws, but it gives me something to think. To us as human, it said, but also machines make mistakes. And a big section in this festival is about these machine errors. Technology is not always right, and it's not always the best solution or the quickest way of doing something. No, actually, our obsession with perfection is also some kind of velocity. It can bring catastrophic results. And this brings me to our next speaker. Next speaker has an interesting background because she comes from high tech, so to say, she comes from programming, software development, but she's also a storyteller. She tells stories, she's an educator, she writes about this, and she knows what she's writing and talking about because she did the programming before. Meredith Broussard will talk about artificial intelligence, doesn't do as much as you think errors in concepts of AI. And Meredith is now an assistant professor at the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute of New York, NYU University. And she's working as an educator and she has a background, as I said, in, in computing, software development, at the at and Bell Labs and at MIT Media Labs. And she's here because she was working on a book. She just published a book, Artificial Unintelligence. And I think this is quite an interesting concept because we're talking about AI. Last year's title of the festival was Artificial Intelligence, AI. But the other I, what does it mean? <laughs> and now we have this kind of unintelligence. And she will talk about the philosophies of our enthusiasm for finding always technology solutions to every aspect of our lives. And she always stresses that computers, computerized solutions are not always the best solution. And very interesting to hear from her what she has to say about this human-machine interaction. And can we develop a sort of social intelligence, not artificial, and not intelligent, unintelligent, maybe it's some kind of social intelligence is needed. Very happy to have you here, Meredith. Thanks for coming. Please welcome Meredith Broussard. Thank you. Slides. Uh, no, I have slides. Are they uh, are they available? Yes. All right. Great. Well, why don't you take this? Um, and uh, while we're uh, while we're getting set up, 
Uh, why don't I tell you a little bit about, uh, about my new book? So my new book is called Artificial Unintelligence, How Computers Misunderstand the World. And it's a book that's about the inner workings and the outer limits of technology. So I'm thrilled to be here at ours. Uh, and actually, this is my, uh, this is my second, uh, this is the second time that my work has been here at Ars Electronica, which is very exciting. Uh, I had a piece here in uh, 1996, uh, when of course I was just a baby, and uh, it was part of, a, uh, part of a larger project called the Brain Opera. So that was very exciting. And that actually brought me to uh, my research today, which is about artificial intelligence for investigative reporting. So it was a long and complicated road uh, to get there. Um, oh, do we have slides yet? Oh, they're almost there. This is very exciting. Yes, that's it. Except in English, please. Oh, there we go. Excellent. Okay, here we go. Artificial intelligence doesn't do as much as you think. Uh, one of the reasons I wrote this book is because I do a lot of presentations and, you know, the first 10 minutes is always occupied with, the, uh, with getting things going. So one of the things that I write about in my book and in my research is I write about data journalism, which is a relatively new uh, field of journalism. It is the process or the practice of finding stories in numbers and using numbers to tell stories. Uh, if you're familiar with The Upshot, which is part of the New York Times, they do data journalism. Uh, if you read ProPublica, which is an American investigative journalism outlet, they do data journalism. Uh, also, Vox and the Texas Tribune are known for data journalism in the United States. And I do a very specific kind of data journalism called algorithmic accountability reporting, where I write algorithms in order to hold decision makers accountable. So increasingly, algorithms are being used to make decisions on our behalf. And so one of the things that is the responsibility of a free press is we need to investigate those uh, black box algorithms in order to make sure that the decisions that the algorithms are making are fair and are for the benefit of society. Now, one of the errors that usually comes up when we're thinking about artificial intelligence uh, is the problem of Hollywood. So usually when people think about AI, they think about Arnold Schwarzenegger as the Terminator, right? He's, uh, he's always the first one that I think of. Uh, they think of the movie Ex Machina. Uh, sometimes they think about uh, bad stock art images of robots. Uh, and then also they think about Commander Data from Star Trek. Uh, anybody think about Commander Data when they, uh, when they think about AI? Right? Yeah. Uh, he, was, he figures large in the imagination of a certain generation. But the thing is, this is not artificial intelligence, okay? This is totally imaginary. And this is actually how our brains work, right? Our brains get confused between what is real and what is imaginary. So when we're thinking about AI, we have to remind ourselves that we have all these Hollywood images embedded in our collective unconscious, and we need to push past that. So what's actually real about AI? AI is a branch of computer science, just like algebra is a branch of mathematics. And inside AI, as a branch of computer science, there are actually lots of different subfields. And one of the subfields is called machine learning. Now, there are other branches of artificial intelligence besides machine learning. And I see we have some AI researchers in the audience today. They're probably nodding along and saying, yes, I know about these other subfields. Uh, expert systems are another subfield. Uh, natural language processing and natural language generation are other subfields. But you don't hear that much about these subfields because they're not as popular as machine learning. Machine learning is far and away the most popular subfield of AI, and something interesting has happened with the language of machine learning and artificial intelligence. The two terms have become conflated. So when people say artificial intelligence nowadays, 
usually what they mean is machine learning. All right, so the two terms have become very confused. And this happens with language. It's very, very normal for terms to come to resemble each other, but it makes it very, very confusing for, uh, for most of us who are trying to, uh, trying to keep up with what's going on scientifically. Uh, so AI is a branch of computer science. There are other branches, but machine learning is the most popular right now. Another thing to keep in mind is the idea of general and narrow artificial intelligence. So general AI is the Hollywood kind. That's the kind that has the, uh, you know, that is in the popular imagination of like the computer that's going to take over the world and murder all of humankind, you know, this, uh, this idea or the idea that of machines that think totally imaginary. What we actually have is we have narrow artificial intelligence. Narrow AI is very real. That's what machine learning belongs to, even though it sounds, you know, the name machine learning sounds like it's a machine that's thinking, but it's not really. Narrow AI is math. It's very, very complicated math, and it is beautiful math. One of the things that's amazing about math is it allows us to uh, articulate the regular patterns in the universe, and that's just incredible. But it's not magic. It's just math. So narrow AI is what we have, and general AI is the fantasy. So in terms of the narrow AI that we have, I want to talk a little bit about what is machine learning exactly. And I want to talk about the Titanic, because the Titanic is a really good example that can tell us a lot about machine learning. Uh, so when you think about the Titanic, who pops into your head? You said it over here, right? Who is it? Leonardo DiCaprio, right? The Titanic, James Cameron's Titanic movie was one of the most successful movies ever made, all right? I'll bet 99% of the people in this room have seen the movie Titanic. Uh, it was one of the biggest box office hits of all time. It's part of our collective unconscious. And again, it's Hollywood. That is, uh, that is shaping our perceptions of an historical event. When I think about the Titanic, uh, the ship, I don't think about this black and white image. I think about how it looked in the movie. And I think about Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Lindlet and the, you know, I am the king of the world shot, right? Uh, and also the Titanic uh, disaster gave us a lot of data. So this is a really good, uh, really good learning example for doing data journalism and for doing data science in general. So what does the Titanic data look like? It looks like this. Okay, this is a, a very, very popular Titanic data set, and it shows who are the passengers on the Titanic, and what we can do is we can write a machine learning uh, algorithm that will predict who survived and who perished in the Titanic disaster, which is kind of cool. We're going to do some data science right here. All right, so what do we have in our, uh, in our columns here? We have P class, the first one, passenger class. Are they traveling first, second, or third class? We have survived, which is a one or a zero, a Boolean value. One means yes, zero means no. Uh, we have the name, we have the sex, we have the age, uh, and some other information, including the fare. All right, so when we do machine learning, we have numbers look just like this. And what are we going to do? We're going to make a model. So this is uh, an elementary school math, uh, math, equation, or math activity uh, called a function machine. And the instructions say, drag each number into the function machine and look for a pattern that will allow you to complete the table. And so over on the, uh, on the right side of this, we have uh, a list of ins and outs. So the idea is you put a number in, and then something happens inside the machine with all the gears and things, and you get another number out. So you put in a two, you get out negative one. You put in a three, you get out a zero. You put in a four, you get out a one. So what's the rule that's happening inside this function machine? Minus three. OK, great. 
Uh, so if you can handle this, you can handle machine learning. What we do in machine learning is we do very much the same process. We put in an input x, and then we've got a black box model, and then we get an output of x. And what we're going to do with the Titanic data is we're going to put in our data, and we're going to make a model. We're going to get the computer to make a model for us using some very, very complicated mathematics uh, in uh, you know, multiple dimensions. And we're going to get the computer to create a model, and we're going to allow it to uh, predict for us whether or not a person survived. OK? So we can do this. And then the benefit of doing this is that we can reuse the model on different data. All right? So if I were a, uh, an insurance company, what I could do is I could take this Titanic data, and I could use it to create a model predicting who survives a maritime disaster. And then I could use that same model to run on somebody who is applying for travel insurance for an upcoming boat trip. And I could use this model to say, all right, how much should you be charged in order to uh, buy travel insurance? But here's a problem with this. When you look at the math of the Titanic data, it turns out that the most important determining factor on whether or not somebody survived the Titanic disaster was their passenger class. So first class passengers survive at a much higher rate than second or third class passengers. So if we use this in order to make our model that our insurance company is going to use, it turns out that first class passengers are more likely to survive, and so they're going to be charged less for insurance than people who travel second or third class. And does that feel fair to anybody? No, it doesn't meet any of our social definitions of what is fair. All right, so this is one of the ways that if we depend exclusively on the mathematical or the algorithmic interpretations of the world, we're not going to match up with our social expectations. This is one of the ways that computers misunderstand the world. And there are also things that computers ultimately cannot understand. So the situation I like to think about uh, when I think about what can't a computer fundamentally understand is I think about Jack Thayer and Milton Long, who were two passengers on the Titanic. Uh, they were young men of the same social stratum. Uh, they were about the same age. They were about the same size physically. And they both helped to save a lot of the fellow passengers. They saved babies. They saved children. And they were among the last people on the Titanic as the ship was going down. So they were standing at the rail, and they watched the lifeboats pull away. And they said goodbye to each other. They said, it's time to jump. So Milton went over the railing first. He climbed over. He shook hands with his friend Jack. And he said, it's been great knowing you. And he dropped straight down next to the boat. And Jack watched his friend go over the rail. And he said, all right, it's time for me to jump. And he climbed over the rail. And Jack leaped out as far as he could away from the boat. And Jack's was the only strategy that worked. Milton was pulled down into the maelstrom, and he died. And Jack survived. He jumped far out. He swam to a lifeboat, and he survived the disaster. Now, that difference, the difference in the angle of the jump, straight down or far out, that's nowhere in the Titanic data. All right? The data looks like this. There are no angles of jumps. And there's really no way for the computer to record or even note that the angle of the jump was different. So when we rely exclusively on machine interpretations of data, we're not getting everything that we know is the complex representation of what's going on in the world. Now, it's a mistake to think that computers can do everything for us and can do everything better than human beings. Computers are really great. 
Literally, the first line of my book is, I love technology. And I do. Computers are a marvelous addition to our world. Uh, but what I want to argue for is I want to argue for a more nuanced understanding of what computers can and can't do. So for many years, we've been laboring under an assumption that I call techno-chauvinism. Techno-chauvinism is the idea that computers are always the highest and best solution. It's the idea that technology is better than people. And technology is not better than people. It's really about using the right tool for the task. What are you trying to do? And what is the best method for doing that? Uh, one is not better than the other. But who has told us that technology is better than people? Well, early computer scientists were mathematicians, right? Mathematics is the parent of computer science. Computer science is a descendant of mathematics. And mathematicians, for hundreds of years, have had this idea that solving mathematical problems is superior to solving social problems. They have an idea, they have a bias, that math is better than people. Mathematicians are kind of snobs in a certain way. Uh, who tells us that uh, solving computational problems or solving engineering problems is superior to uh, solving social problems? Or who tells us that technology is our savior when it comes to social problems? Right? Uh, we've got some folks up here. Uh, we've got Claude Shannon, we've got Alan Turing, we've got Marvin Minsky, we've got John von Neumann, we've got Larry Page and Sergey Brin. And so what do you notice about all of these folks? They're white, they are men, all right? Uh, they are a very, very homogeneous group. They're all uh, very intellectually homogeneous. They're homogeneous in terms of gender, uh, in terms of their background, they're not representational of the entire uh, diversity of human experience. One of the problems with this is that people embed their own biases in technology. Okay, so when we have a very small and homogeneous group of people giving us all of the ideas that we, uh, that we collectively believe right now about technology and society, that's not inclusive that's not getting us toward more inclusive technology. And people embed their own biases in technology that they build. Sometimes it's conscious, sometimes it's unconscious. And the thing about unconscious bias is that you can't see it. Okay. There's also a factor called positive asymmetry at work. Uh, positive asymmetry uh, is the way that we don't like to talk about anything yucky. So when you're building technology and you're in a group of people, you tend to focus on the good, you tend to not focus on the bad. So if you are writing an algorithm to uh, determine how much people should pay for travel insurance, you're gonna say, oh, I have this great new algorithm, it's gonna make things so much easier and it's going to make things so much more fair. And you're not gonna say, oh, well, this actually might discriminate against uh, poor people and might privilege rich people because you don't want to say that, because it's uncomfortable. All right, so positive asymmetry is a social factor that is at work in these technological environments. And then I also want to talk a little bit about race. Have you seen this uh, viral video of the racist soap dispenser? Yeah? OK, a couple of people have. Uh, the way this video goes is that uh, a man with dark skin puts his hand under the soap dispenser, and it doesn't work. And then a man with light skin puts his hand under the soap dispenser, and it works. Uh, and the light skin man puts it back under. Then the dark skin man takes a white paper towel and puts it under the soap dispenser, and it works. Right? It's absolutely horrifying. So we've known for years that uh, image recognition systems, which is what's embedded, which built into the soap dispenser, image recognition systems uh, do not recognize people with darker skin. We've known this for years. Nobody has done anything about it, in part because it's a very homogeneous group of people who are making the technology. And there has not been a lot of will 
on the part of technology makers to fix this feature. Okay. However, what scares me is the way that uh, these kinds of naive algorithms are embedded in technologies like self-driving cars. So self-driving cars also rely on image recognition algorithms. They're the same kinds of image recognition algorithms that are in the soap dispenser, which doesn't work very well. Uh, and so these image recognition algorithms that are in self-driving cars are actually so naive that you can defeat them easily. So if you put a sparkly unicorn sticker onto a stop sign, the self-driving car would no longer recognize this as a stop sign, and it would just blow right through, and it would cause an accident. Now, that doesn't seem safe to me. And I don't know about you, but stop signs are, I see a lot of graffiti on stop signs. You know, I see signs regularly defaced out there in the world. So that's going to lead to more situations, like the situation we recently had in Tempe, Arizona, where a self-driving Uber uh, killed an innocent pedestrian. So this is one of the reasons that I think we need to, uh, we need to push back against techno-chauvinism. We need to push back against the uh, cognitive biases that, uh, that Nathan mentioned that are very, very common in our human experience. Uh, they're not bad, but they do necessarily bad, uh, but they do exist, they're a part of the errors that are a part of our lives, and we can embrace them, all right? We can make technology that is inclusive. We can, take, we can make technology that does account for human error, and that's going to get us to a much better world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Meredith. Very interesting topic. I'd like to call my speakers actually on stage for a small Q&A. Um, so we, will, we can discuss topics they mentioned, and also the audience can take part in this. So if you have any questions, Maybe in a circle. <laughs> People are tired. <laughs> All right. Oh, looks yep. like we have a question over there. Okay. Let's start with the audience then, because I'm sure there's many questions. I have an immediate follow-up question to your to your uh, talk, Meredith. Um, do you think that for any? data sets that are being made based on, especially um, uh, uh, recognition of, of human skin, human faces, um, that regulation would help? Meaning that if you are bringing products to market that are based on data sets generated for you know, uh, recognizing people, mm -hmm. um, that they are made um, based on data sets that are inclusive. Oh, that is a, uh, oh, am I still on? Yep. Yep. All right. So that's a great question, and absolutely yes, regulation would help. Uh, one of the really interesting uh, things that's out there uh, being discussed right now is regulation around facial recognition, because facial recognition uh, is getting better and better, and uh, it's very cheap and it's very easy to use. So you can go and you can uh, sign up for an Amazon developer account and you can start building a facial recognition app in like 10 minutes. Uh, however, that is not, uh, that proliferation is not necessarily going to lead to more social justice. It's probably going to lead to a greater surveillance state. And in the United States, uh, police technologies have been uh, unfairly deployed uh, against communities of color uh, and have been deployed at a much greater rate against communities of color, which has led to the mass incarceration crisis in the United States. So we need regulation that says, okay, if we're going to develop facial recognition technology, we need to do it in a, uh, in a meaningful way that's not discriminatory, and we need to really limit its uses by police. 
So facial recognition technology itself is not bad. And you know, doing a facial recognition app in an amazing art context would be incredibly fun and, uh, and meaningful and might make amazing art. But having facial recognition technology on uh, cameras that are on every street light in the city and that are following you around the city and then uh, you know, charging you with crimes, that's not something that we really want. So it's about nuance to the context. Any more questions? Yes, the gentleman, first row. Yeah, also regarding the Titanic example, um, I assume that um, the prediction of the machine learning algorithm is somehow statistically valid. So it's correct in a statistical way, but it doesn't account for individual behavior. So some predictions are wrong. Are you saying you could devise a machine that would be better? Or what is your claim in something is wrong with machine learning technology, techno-chauvinism, as you said? Would you do a better job designing a better machine? And then how would you do it? Uh, so in terms of what can we do that makes us uh, have better design, uh, generally there are two modes of thinking about how do we design systems. There's uh, the thinking about autonomous systems, and then there's the thinking about human in the loop systems. Uh, and autonomous systems are like the fantasy of, say, the, uh, the self-driving situation where you just like tap an app and a car shows up and it takes you to where you want to go and then it just disappears into the ether, right? And it doesn't have any seeming human intervention. Whereas a human in the loop system is like what we have in our cars right now where uh, we have like an assisted parking feature or we have a thing that uh, starts beeping when your car goes too close to the center line. All right, so techno-chauvinists say that autonomous systems are better than human-in-the-loop systems, and I would say, well, let's, uh, let's think more about the value of human-in-the-loop systems. Um, I really like the way that this uh, merges, actually, with Nathan's research on uh, what is the value of, of error, what is the value of an accident, because there's enormous value in serendipity, in discovery, in learning. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> but you're both working on the concept of social intelligence in a way, no? In both books I actually read about this, so maybe you want to say something. Well, yes, the, um, the, as great as machine learning is, and I've actually done a little research on machine learning myself, um, n nothing that we've ever come up with in a lab has come close to the computing power of the human brain. And so um, evolution through its totally random, error-based, error-prone system has come up with this powerful computer. Um, but like all computers, it's prone to enormous biases, biases. And it's also what we're programmed to do is to make judgments quickly and then stick with them. Because if you can imagine life in, in the savanna and the Pleistocene epoch, making a decision quickly saved your life. And also, making judgments and sticking with them probably saved your life. So if you were scared or frightened of a certain uh, threat, whether that threat was a snake or a person who didn't look like you, that probably saved your life. So for millions of years, those biases got baked into our DNA. And the thing about cognitive biases is that just knowing about them doesn't make them go away. Right? That's the first step. Obviously, we have to admit those prejudices and those biases but you have to do a ton of work because you're, you're going upstream. You're pushing a boulder up the mountain. And that's what a lot of white people um, aren't willing to do. Not, not because they just like being prejudiced, but because they think it's not their fault. Well, you know, I know it. I'm doing the best I can. They don't want to have to do the hard work. And just like AI and our political considerations with AI, the easiest thing to do would be to let it run away and start making all of these decisions which we know are bad. So if we, with millions of years of tweaking through evolution, 
recognize that we make these poor decisions. Uh, we're just now going to just offload the, those poor decision making to a machine. We'll be, we'll be right back where we started um, and with less ability to, to control it. Yeah, thanks. It's um, because both of you had this very strong emphasis on social justice and it resonated really well. I mean, many of your arguments sort of have some Darwinian or evolutionary theory in it. And that's the surprise because normally we say, oh, no, 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 never apply that to human society. Human society is different. And um, I just wanted to, to ask you about this point and I want to give you a quote by um, uh, Georges Conguillem, who even used a stronger word. He said in reading Darwin that it's a theory about the creativity of aberration and the abnormal. So that would be even stronger on this uh, social side of it. So what, do you, what, what are your thoughts? Well, yeah, and, and I, I sort of said that uh, without saying it uh, at the beginning where I said that all of our creative innovation came from mistakes. And it was the same thing. I'm sure the first um, mud skipper who really took his first gulp of air was a freak, was a weirdo, was definitely an outcast and unlike. And in fact, that can um, either work for or against you in terms of fitting into your social group. And, uh, and I'm talking about for animals here, but the same is obviously true for humans. Um, and so we begin as aberrations in each one of our evolutionary steps. And that's true both cognitively and um, uh, and, and genetically, biologically. But an important point that this raises, I think, is an issue we're now dealing with socially called neurodiversity. And this idea of all of these different kinds of personalities that we want to label as disordered or, or um, needing fix or whatever. Uh, and I'm not just talking about the autism spectrum, but even, even broaching into mental illness. Some of these are probably personality types uh, that are baked into our, our, our DNA and our, and our style to give us that diversity, to give us a rich population of people who think differently, who interact with the world differently and interact with each other. Because if evolution has one, one wisdom to share with all of us, it's that you never know what challenges around the corner. And the best way to be prepared is to have as diverse a population as possible so that somebody will get us through whatever the next challenge is. And so neurodiversity of personality types um, and, and, and other things like that is, is an important part of our survival in the past. And I think we're, we're, we're we're working against that now. And in fact, there's a lot of been written now of how many things in our world is, uh, how many things are biased against introverts. So just simply being extroverted and loving to do what I'm doing right now gives you enormous advantages from getting into a good college to getting a job to get, being invited to speak at a conference in Austria, right? That you, being an introvert is such a huge burden that you carry in our world today, but that's all because of how we've designed it. There were probably many times in our past, and throughout our past, where having those diverse ways of thinking uh, and behaving was a good thing. I think that uh, the, case of, the case of art is also a really good illustration of why we want to value diversity and we want to value serendipity. So when you, uh, when you make new art, it's really exciting to see something that's different. But when you look at art that is purely derivative of art that has already been made, it's very, very boring, right? And there is a lot of art that, yeah, it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of reassuring. Like, how many undergraduates do you think in the world have, uh, have that Van Gogh, uh, Van Gogh painting, like a poster of a Van Gogh in their dorm room? Like having Starry Night on the wall in your dorm room is like a rite of passage and it's very comforting and that has value in the world. On the other hand, we do want things that are new. We want things that are creative. If we just made art where we took Starry Night and all the other popular artworks and we put them into an algorithm that we just made art that was based on that, then we would actually never get anything new. We would only get things that are derivative. You know, so there's, there's a place for everything. You know, we, want, uh, we want what is familiar and we want what is new. Very good, very good statement because we need actually the errors, we need these mistakes, mm -hmm. right? To develop as humans, yeah. to develop our arts, to make better programs, to work in a better way. I have a question for all of you probably. Uh, the future outlook. Nathan, you said you are optimistic, not so optimistic, 50% chance of survival. Are we still evolving, actually? <laughs> uh, 
can we evolve? Will we, won't we be immortal? And uh, I don't know, this would be positive for me. But it was quite bland and sad when you closed. Yeah. Um, well, are we still evolving is a question that gets debated a, a number of ways. I, I, of course we're still evolving. No, no matter what, we're evolving culturally, uh, which is important and that does interact with our biology. Um, I, I often say it this way, if, if cultural evolution wasn't important, then is it just a coincidence that you speak the same language that your parents do? Um, and languages are inherited better than genes are in some ways. Um, so cultural evolution is super important and we're evolving, but we're also evolving because of different ways that we uh, have approached reproduction. So now reproduction is largely based on choice, right? Almost every individual in the developed world grows to reproductive age and then makes a choice. Um, and so who, who's reproducing and who's not is now a bigger force than natural selection, a bigger force than uh, you know, sort of medical fitness, which is, which is good, I think. I mean, I'm sure glad that the winners and losers in our evolutionary story um, are not just those who have, have perfect bodies. Um, so we are evolving. As for immortality, there's, that's the, the, the least biological concept that's come up today is immortality because our own mortality and sort of making room for new generations is a key part of, of our evolutionary past and our evolutionary history of all living things. Um, so I, I'm certainly not one who hopes we go the route of immortality. I'd like to stay healthy as long as I can, but um, at some point we're gonna run out of space on this planet. <laughs> um, and we're not doing a great job managing resources as it is, so um, I hope we don't go that way. So still 50% chance. I, as for uh, catastrophe, yeah, I'd say we're on a nice edge right now. <laughs> Future outlook. A future outlook on, let's say, if you look at, I want to get away from the evolution paradigm a little and to a more social paradigm. If you look at the de developments in post-Fordist work environments nowadays, you see a, a wide range of blurring of boundaries where you would have like tools like computers that are at the same time the tools you work with, but at the same time the, the tools you communicate with, at the same time the tools that you play with a great deal. And um, you can, of course, pose the question, does playing on computers and using it for communication not also train you for uh, a better performance in work environments? And that's basically what we see here. And that what, that's what Anna said before, that we are now on the verge of developing the situation that no longer algorithmic uh, environments like computers or other media are the environment that we work in, but rather we as uh, behaving um, and <coughs> performing individuals become the environment of, of these technologies in a way. And that's a quite common idea in organizational soci sociology, but um, we will see what that brings about in the next, say, 15 years. Interesting. Future outlook? Uh, human future. in the loop is a very interesting concept. Yeah, I'm very optimistic about building human in the loop systems. Uh, I, I, like Nathan, I do not want to be immortal. I, I, I'm perfectly happy with my body wearing out when it's my time. Uh, I know a lot of people are not comfortable with that, but I really am. Uh, and also something interesting about the future of work. Um, so my, uh, my husband is actually writing a book right now about co-working spaces. And one of the interesting things that he's discovered was uh, for a long time we had these notions that uh, the internet was going to set us all free and we were all going to uh, not, we wouldn't need to go to the office anymore and everybody would work at home and we would have distributed uh, work environments and we would collaborate online and a lot of that has actually come true You know, we have fabulous collaboration tools uh, nowadays, but also we have the rise of co-working spaces So we work is uh, one of the largest uh, commercial real estate tenants in the entire United States and Co-working spaces have arisen because people don't actually really like working at home we don't like being alone, we're social creatures. And so when people's jobs, uh, when people's collective workspaces get eliminated and they start working at home, it gets really lonely. 
and then so people join co-working spaces. And so it's exactly the opposite of what we were promised, right? It's very counterintuitive that uh, we would want to work digitally in the company of other people. So it makes me, uh, it makes me hopeful that, uh, that our, human, uh, our human impulses are going to win out over our machine impulses and our social and cultural impulses are going to, uh, are going to persevere. Great, yeah, really interesting. A quick note, because we have to do a roundup for the next session. Yes. Um, I want to dovetail off that because it was an excellent point. Um, the idea that um, corporations and other businesses thought it would be great if you could just work at home. Isn't that so much better? They tried to convince us of this, and then, of course, people uh, vote with their feet, and they go to these WeWork spaces. But that's because they were allowed to. They had the freedom to do that, and there were options available. What, what, what worries me in all of these contexts is who's making our choices for us. Who are we giving over um, the, the ability to make these choices too, because the people right now making the choices don't really represent us necessarily, especially when it comes to corporations and other entities that have a, a vested interest. The best example I give of this is um, at, at my college, so this was in the 90s, uh, they were gonna get rid of all the smoking lounges on campus. Uh, there was people marching and, and, and signs and everything. But then a survey came out that was conducted by a student council member that said 98% of the student body was against removing the smoking lounges. And, and he had all these survey results and he showed it and then you had to bear down to find out he took the survey in the smoking lounges. That's where he gave the survey out. Um, and it's sort of the same thing where the people who are designing the tech and deploying it, all the, the people you saw, all the, the white men, that white techie men that are making all these decisions for us about driving cars, they're making the decisions and we're not in the room, uh, all of us. We need to vote with our feet and we need to vote at the ba ballot box as well, but we need to vote with our feet and show um, people because the market will respond if they, if they think there's something there. But at the same time, if we're not in the room, if the survey's only happening in the smoking lounge, then we're not gonna get the kind of world that we want. It's a great statement. So we have to engage in the discussion. And thanks so much for being here and working on the subject of social intelligence. I think that's what it comes back to. No? We don't have to be perfect. It's okay to be good enough for a task. This is what my learning is. No? Being good enough it comes from software development. Being good enough for life, for the task. So thanks for being here. It was really great and interesting. I was scribbling down a lot. Thanks for our audience. We will see you at 12 o'clock. Thank you. Thanks so much.
Hello and welcome back. This is the STARTS Talks. STARTS, the innovation of science, technology and the arts. And it's about two prizes appointed by the European Commission. It's very interesting because now it's like the practical part of our morning session. The morning we discussed like error and the fragile of humanity and how to deal with it was the answer in the end. And now we see two examples how we can actually deal with it. We have designers, artists here that make errors in their quests to find new solution. Trial and error, trial and error, error, try again. So it is about making mistakes and daring to make mistakes also. Our designers realize something. They realize complex projects, like having robots plotting and building a bridge, automatically, semi-automatically, we will see. Or making a home kit for the female biophilia for vaginal health. Very interesting. Uh, the starts prices are appointed by the European Commission and until 2020, Ars Electronica, in cooperation with Bosa and De Wach, is issuing these calls. And the grand prize for innovative collaboration between industry or technology and the arts was award, awarded to our next speaker, Tim Goethens. Thanks, Tim, for being here. Thank you. He worked on a project, the 3D printed steel bridge. And I all ask you to go to the exhibition after one o'clock because we show all the projects and of course the winning projects. It's just outside after the cafe area. So you can see what our winners and our participants did. So thanks Tim for being here. Thanks, thanks for uh, inviting us. And, uh, Thanks, thanks to the organization to uh, award us with this uh, great Starts Prize, and we are really grateful and honored to, uh, to be part of this. And um, well, I, I want to tell you something about the bridge project that we are doing, that we almost completed, actually. Um, a crazy project. We've been working on it for the last three years, I think. And uh, right now, it's, it's nearing completion, uh, finally, uh, I, I could say. And when talking about the project, I always, I always think about this guy, <laughs> I don't know this guy personally, this, uh, this, his name is Nikolai Suchajin. He's a Russian entrepreneur, uh, although some say he's a, he's a crime lord, local crime lord. I, I don't know which is true, but what's uh, cool about this guy is that at a certain point, this guy wanted to build his own house. So he went to the municipality, a uh, local government, and he applied for a permit for a two-story building, two-story wooden building, and he started building it. And then the building was done and he looked at his neighbors and his neighbors uh, had a three-story building. So he thought, well, you know, I have to uh, top that. So he decided to add an extra level to it. And then he stood on top of his house and he thought, you know, um, I kind of like the view, but uh, if I build it just a little bit higher, you know, the view would be even better. In the end, it resulted in this building. <laughs> this is actually a almost 45 meter high wooden building. Uh, the, at the time of building, it was the highest wooden structure uh, in the world, the hi highest, uh, tallest wooden house in the world. And he built that completely single-handedly. And the reason why I, I kind of like this example is because, uh, you know, this bridge project for us was a little bit the same. We started somewhere, we started at a certain point, and we didn't know where it was going to take us, you know? You, so you, you have a crazy ID. Uh, but before you know it, the idea gets crazier and crazier and crazier. And, you know, before you know it, you have a building like this. And there's a few more parallels, but I'll, I'll get to another parallel later. So we haven't always been uh, bridge builders. Uh, we, we started out as a design company, which we still are, uh, around uh, Joris Lahman, a Dutch designer. And the uh, last 15 years, we've been working on, fair, on a lot of experimental furniture that we sell through a gallery in uh, New York. And uh, we work with new materials, uh, new techniques, and you know, during the last 15 years, we've worked a lot with 3D printing in an ever-increasing amount. And 
a good example of, of the use of 3D printing actually is uh, this chair, this is the bone chair. It's a, the first one was produced in 2006. It's a very complex shape. I'm not going to tell too much about the design. Uh, that, that could be a lecture in itself. But the way of pr producing back then, if we had the op opportunity to 3D print it in metal, we would have. But it wasn't possible then. So what we did instead was we printed the mold in a ceramic-like material. And then we casted uh, the aluminium right into it. A bit more recent chair that we produced, that where we actually did use metal 3D printing, uh, is, is uh, this chair. This is printed with a really cool machine. Uh, it it's, has a really high level of detail. It can print in, in aluminium, in uh, stainless steel, many different materials. And uh, it's just a machine that has a few downsides for us. One of them is the price. Uh, a machine like this will cost you at least half a million euros. Oh, you can't see the images, okay. No problem. Yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. They can't see it here, I think. No, no problem. The conference is about error, right? So. <laughs> Yeah, we could do that, yeah. <coughs> Sorry? For me, it's fine, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if uh, I think everybody can see everything on this monitor, right? Or not? Oh, no, but, uh, yeah, but I can. Okay. Yeah, this is the fast Ah, Thank you. perfect, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> this is innovation, right? <laughs> they should reconsider the starts prize, I think. This, this guy should get it. <laughs> so.
So um, shall I continue? Yeah. So I, I was talking about this machine, uh, the machine that's, uh, uh, that, that we use to print jazz, which is a really cool machine, but it has a few downsides. One, as I explained, was the price of a machine like this. But the other one is even, even a bigger downside for us, and that's the, the, the build, building volume. So on the left you see the final chair, and on the right you see in how many pieces we had to actually cut it up in order to fit uh, in, in a building volume. It's like six building volume, and I think it's 16 pieces. And since we didn't find any 3D printing company that would help us uh, develop a 3D printer that's big enough to print full-size furniture, we decided to uh, take matters into our own hands. And we, we bought an old retired robot from the car industry, and together with two students from, uh, from university, we developed this machine. And it's using a two-component, really fast-curing resin to print lines almost in, in mid-air. We actually, we, we, we kind of like this idea because you, lose, you use six axes rather than the, the normal three axes of a robot. And, it, and this allows you to not just print inside a building volume, but also move outside of that building volume and you know, print parts and pieces of, of virtually unlimited size. Because if you, you know, if you are reaching the end of your building uh, reach, you just move the robot and you can keep on printing. However, this material wasn't really what we wanted. It's a really lightweight, brittle, uh, not appealing material. So we thought, what if we would do the same with uh, metal? What if we take uh, a welding machine and attach that to the robot and start printing with this? And then, then we can make suddenly, suddenly we can make full-size steel objects. And um, brilliant idea, we thought. We were dreaming about early retirement. But unfortunately, we found uh, this patent. 1925, of a guy that did actually exactly the same, who used a welding technique to make decorative articles. But luckily he didn't have robots at the time and he didn't have a computer, so there was more than enough for us to uh, develop actually. So, you know, we started working on it, we got better at it, printing simple lines, more complex lines. At a certain point we even, um, we could print uh, more complex structures. Of, of course, not everything went right. What you see here actually happened a few times. We uh, set fire to the brooms that were in, uh, in the workshop, <laughs> trying to keep a tidy uh, workspace. But you know, let's say you, you need all those things to learn and to get better at uh, what you're doing. And then at a certain point we found, we, we felt confident enough to, to print actual uh, pieces with it. So this is also a Joris Lamann piece, it's called the Dragon Bench. We already made, I think, seven or eight of those. Uh, they're made out of stainless steel, and the cool thing about it is all of them are, all of those are unique, unique pieces, which is obviously with 3D printing, you know, you can make, you don't, you don't need molds, so you can make one-of-a-kind pieces of everything. But, you know, our, ambitious, uh, our ambitions uh, rose a bit higher, and we thought, okay, what else can we do with this technique? And by that time we were on the radar of uh, Autodesk, the, the software company in the US, and they invited us to San Francisco. And uh, the evening before we had the meeting, we were thinking, okay, we need to present something to those guys that's really going to blow their minds. We need something that we can print that's, you know, that they're really going to uh, like. And literally over a beer in our uh, Airbnb garden, we came to the idea that it really had to become a bridge. Because, you know, if you Printing a bridge means you need um, a mature 3D printing technique. You need uh, good material, strong material, you need a bigger size than just the small iPhone cases that are uh, being printed most of the time. So it totally made sense. We are from Amsterdam, uh, it's known for the bridges and canals, so it totally made sense to make a bridge. But then, you know, then we had the idea, they were enthusiastic about it, we were enthusiastic about it, and instantly we were worried about what we promised. We were like, okay, we're going to make a bridge, now what? So, to kind of get an idea what our first plan was, uh, I made this uh, hand-drawn animation. It took, took quite some evenings. And to st our first initial dream was to have the robots walk over the bridge as it was printing it. It turned out to be too complex and too time and money consuming to do so. So I spent a lot of time on this animation and then I came to the studio to show the animation. And then uh, my colleague uh, Gijs, I think, he came up with this photo. 
uh, the Sydney Harbour Bridge, really similar in design. And uh, uh, but I, what I really like is the fact that it's, in a way, it's the same, right? That that was also a very analog way of 3D printing, just moving metal to a different location. And 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 on the left, it's really digital, and on the right, it's a really analog way. So. You know, I'm not showing this because I have to uh, from our sponsors, but because it really shows how many companies, how many people you need to, to do a project like this. And this is just, this list is not up to date anymore. It could be like twice as long. There's literally hundreds, maybe even thousands of people uh, worked with us to get this project actually uh, working. And the design also was quite a big challenge. Uh, first, we had some wild ideas of how we could print a bridge because, you know, 3D printing allows you to print really complex shapes. So com complexity is suddenly a completely different issue than it was before. But we found out that it's not just about um, what you want to print, but it's also about what you are allowed to do. A bridge is more than just uh, something that's printed. It's a construction. You, there's regulations. There's uh, many, many more things to it than just shape. So we started thinking about a good design for the bridge. A lot of ideas passed uh, the revue. And in the end, we chose uh, this principle. An algorithm is calculating the stress lines within the bridge. And what we did was we translated those stress lines into more dense and more open areas in the bridge. And by that, it's getting the, the, the more material and more strength and stiffness on the places where it needs to be. And in the end, that resulted in, in this uh, design. So if, if we look at the timeline, we started in, in 2015, we, then we announced that we were going to make the bridge. Um, right now we are September 2018, we, we are just about to finish the bridge. Actually, uh, October 21st, then that's the start of the Dutch Design Week in Eindhoven. And we are going to present the bridge there, so it has to be completely done. It's going to take quite a bit of work to get there, but I, I'm sure it's, uh, it's, it's going to work. And then afterwards... Um, so yeah, so, so this is what still needs to be done. We still have to print the swirls that are going to be attached. The bridge deck needs to be attached to it, and then by the time, uh, by October, it'll be completely done. Hopefully, we will be able to place uh, the bridge on a final location in uh, 2019. If that is, um, we get a permit for it, because of course we, you know, the, the, the people have to walk over it. Millions of people every year have to walk over it, so we need a permit for it. And that's also, you know, normally, this is where you apply for the permit, you know, before you start printing. But we didn't have time, uh, we didn't want to wait. We thought, and it's a little bit the same also as this guy, as Nikolai Suchajin, if he would have waited for a permit for this building, it would never have been there. So the only way to get this project done is to start and take the risk of um, maybe not getting a permit at all. That's still a possibility. Of course, you know, it's not just, we don't leave everything just to chance. We are uh, working on a very good way of um, certifying the bridge and of making sure that it's strong enough and, and safe enough. So what we did was we are making a digital twin of the bridge. So we made a scan uh, that's all uh, loaded into a computer algorithm and we are censoring up the bridge, so there's, there's uh, tons of sensors going to be on there that monitor the every millimeter of movement of the bridge when people walk over it. And by doing so, we it's for different reasons, the sensor system, it's also to monitor the traffic in the, um, in the city of Amsterdam, but it's also for uh, certifying the bridge, for proving that it's going to be strong enough. And what we're also doing is full-scale full tests. Uh, coming month, we're going to put 10 tons of weight on the bridge, and then we're going to uh, measure very accurately what the movement of the bridge is. And hopefully, uh, by the end of uh, September, we will be sure that the bridge is going to be strong enough to be placed in, uh, in Eindhoven. So hopefully, you know, 2019, uh, we, we will be able to place the bridge on its final location. So, um, that's basically my presentation. The, the only thing I want to add to it is that, uh, especially a project like this, you know, there's always many reasons not to even start with a project because why? Why would you print a bridge? The, the, it's, it's a very complex thing to do, and it uh, can be painstaking at uh, times. So there's always, you know, hundreds of reasons 
uh, not to do it, but we are always looking for the one reason actually to do it. And uh, if you don't get started with it, you will never uh, finish it. So, uh, so that's that's basically what our um, experience with this project is. So, thanks. Thank you, Tim. Thanks. Can you? Yes. Thank you, Tim. You talk robot, you said. Very good. We are in a bit in a time uh, pressure, so I will just introduce the next speaker now. It's our winner for the grand prize for artistic exploration. And this means that she was awarded this award for the appropriation by the arts with a strong potential, with a strong influence or alter the use or the deployment of the perception of technology. And the project is called Future Flora and is by Giulia Tomasello. Giulia, please. <laughs> And Julia says she's a citizen scientist. It is quite interesting, this concept, so maybe we can discuss this later. Celebrating the female biophilia. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. <laughs> Not yet. <clears throat> now? Yes. yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody, and thank you all for coming and for being here. I'm Giulia Tomasello, and uh, I'm an interaction designer and researcher, and I work in the field of interactive wearables, uh, uh, material finishes, and biotechnologies. So today I'm going to present you the project that got uh, the grand prize for the artistic exploration, and it's called Future Flora. But uh, first I would like to start with uh, a statement which uh, I always like to mention. So. That's me, I'm a woman, I have a body, and my body is a social construction rather than a naturally given datum. And it's a statement from Simone de Beauvoir. So it's really explaining how the woman in the society can be understood in two ways, from the natural woman and from the woman that is actually constructed from what the society is thinking. In my field, in my background, so I'm a product designer and Naturally, I've been growing then with technology, so as an interaction designer, and I work in the field of biohacking, wearables, 3D printing, and biocouture. So those are a few of my projects that are in uh, the slides, and uh, what I'm working uh, with, or what I try to aim every time, is to question and communicate the boundaries between technology and our bodies. So really try to work on this relationship between them. This is one of the environment which I love to work on, and uh, it's a biohacker space. So this in particular is uh, at, uh, in London, in Acne, so it's a, it's a really DIY biohacking space, in a maker space where people like me, like, like you, uh, that are just interested in uh, amateur on working with, uh, from wood to technology, and to biology, they can go and uh, start to grow bacteria or grow microorganisms. So as you can see, it's a really multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary environment because you can merge different uh, um, dis disciplines from design to technology to biology. So what I start to do is to grow um, cellulose at the beginning. And I was growing cellulose like kombucha, that is a, a fermented fungus coming from the fermentation of sugar, tea, and vinegar. This fermentation from the bacteria, it grows this cellulose on the top that when you, as you can see, you kind of pull it out from the bath, it really looks like a vegetable leather. And there are already many designers, like Susan Lee, uh, which they uh, work with it to make a wearable dress which they are not wearable really yet, because as soon as you are wearing them, the moisture of your skin is making the cellulose wet again, so breakable. And uh, in my uh, study, what I wanted to do is trying to hack the process of uh, the kombucha growing and making it conductive. 
So in my specialization, I work with electronic textiles, so textiles that are embedded with technology or with uh, um, copper inside, so a textile can be resistant or conductive. And what I wanted to do is trying to make a biological textile conductive. So at the end of the circle, it was sustainable because the biological part you could recycle and reuse the conductivity. So what I was really trying is to grow a bioconductive skin, even though our skin, if you think about it, it's already conductive. And then I moved to bacteria. So I was really growing bacteria and growing biotextiles, as I call them, because I was really trying to merge bacteria and textile and to see how we can wear bacteria, actually. And the process became so quick and I was so passionate that I started to grow them at home. So from the lab, I was at home and I really was domesticating biotechnology, because if you think they're not like a piece of wood or metal that you take them and you cut and you use them, they're actually living organisms, so you need to nurture them, you need to let them grow, you need to feed them, and you need to take care of them. So you need to see if they're growing good, and when you're using them, if they're alive or if they're already dead. So why the bacteria? Because as we all should know, in our skin microbiome, we are made by the 90% of bacteria and only the 10% of human cell. So if you will start to think that actually maybe we should sometimes think more about these invisible organisms that are surrounding us, then you will change the way you behave because you, you feel aware of something that is going on. And the field where I'm working on using technology and using wearable technology is the field of women's healthcare and female taboo. So, this was my question at the time. What if we would wear bacteria to empower women? So what if you actually think that our makeup is made of bacteria, it's made of something that is living organism, and what actually if you're using them for another purpose? So this is the project, Future Flora, is an harvesting kit designed for women to treat and prevent vaginal infection. Uh, the woman with the kit can make her own pad that is made of bacteria, that are healthy bacteria that uh, you can find in a pipette in the kit. And when you're growing, you are growing really your uh, treatment. So the woman is becoming a participant in this world of science and uh, of her own treatment. And uh, this, this project is coming from different case studies, quite interesting. So the first one, Bacteria, it's a, a product that uh, they launched in the US in 2010. And uh, it was this, it's a soap, essentially, made of bacteria. So the, uh, the scientists behind really um, confirmed that actually, if we are made with bacteria, why we only, we every time wash ourselves to clean them out? Why every time we bleach things? And, uh, so why not that we actually wash ourselves with bacteria to keep our, the balance in our body? I didn't see it yet in the market, but uh, it was uh, launched in 2010. The second one in the, in the middle is a yogurt tampon. So basically, our grandmas, they were suffering as well of vaginal infection, and they didn't have any cream that we have now. So what they were doing, it was to put yogurt in their vagina or in their underwear. And why? This is because the vaginal flora is made mainly on, pro on probiotics or lactobacillus and are the same probiotics that are in the yogurt. So why not to put yogurt in the underwear? And uh, the last case study, it's called vaginal seeding. So this is very recent and it was quite uh, uh, groundbreaking for me because uh, so basically when women give birth through the section C and not with a natural birth, they're not giving the right amount of bacteria that they should give with a natural birth. And so what some women uh, decided to do, it, is, it was to really take some swab of their vagina and to put in the body and the face of the kid. So to really kind of give directly the bacteria that they had in their vagina to the baby. And the doctor, they couldn't say no. Even now, the doctor cannot say no, because rationally it works. But actually, with breastfeeding and during the nurturing of the baby, you're still giving the right amount of bacteria. 
So with Future Florida, you're really growing this living culture pad that when you're wearing in your underwear, it will start to rebalance the flora that is missing during the infection. So now I'm going to show you a quick video uh, that shows how it works. If it goes. No, but you can all come to the exhibition there, where actually there is the, uh, the kit, and you will be able to see um, the, the full video of how it works, the kit, and also uh, a documentary called Girl Biophilia, which actually explains if women will be able to actually wear this uh, bacteria and this uh, pad with bacteria in the underwear. And this project is really coming mainly from uh, the women's in the 70s. So women uh, that in Boston, they were called women's doctor, and they were fighting for their right and for their emancipation. But mainly, not only on this, they were fighting for education. So they were really fighting to make women aware on what is going on with birth control, with menstruation, with pregnancy, that are all social taboo. They're all female taboo, that if we are actually um, a bit honest with ourselves, they are still now. So we are still in this really like a barrier on speaking about even normal menstruation or candida. So these women, they were really meeting every week with other women and trying to explain as if uh, they were a doctor, try to read and to, and to study together actually what we can do all together to solve a menstruation problem or birth control. And they made a book that is called Our Bodies, Ourselves, which in a way became my Bible somehow. And um, so recently, and you will be able to see it also in the exhibition space, um, I've been working also on another project because I forgot to mention, but Future Flora, it was part of my master thesis of two years ago. So it was a master thesis in uh, Central St. Martins at the Material Futures, and uh, I graduated with that. And since then, I started to really work uh, um, proudly, let's say, on women's health care. So this is another project that is called Kant, and uh, it's a project where I've been invited to work on as an artist. And we were invited to reclaim the word Kant. And uh, as we all know, Kant is a, such a disprejective word that you will never like to hear it. But actually, especially in the US, it's, it's really used a lot. And uh, what does it mean, Kant? Kant, it means vagina. So if we really go behind in the etymology and where it's coming from, you actually don't take it anymore as, a, as an offense. Because if you actually are aware of, of, of the word, you, you shouldn't be offended. Who is telling you? It means that really doesn't know where it's coming from. And the whole exhibition was really to kind of explain the, the actually the power of the word. And uh, what I've been working with uh, a colleague was uh, to make a publication that you will be able to see also in the um, in the exhibition, uh, a video where we were actually thinking that Kant was. Uh, our, was uh, the pomegranate. So we were really kind of making the comparison with the fruit because the pomegranate is like round, like a woman. When you cut it, it's bleeding. Uh, inside it has the seeds like ovaries. So we were really playing with this kind of comparison. And we also did a podcast on NTS radio where we are really speaking about Kant qualms. And this is a recent project which I'm working on now and which I, uh, we just won some funding from uh, the Biomaker Challenge. So here I'm working with three scientists from Cambridge Universities, and uh, we are trying to make uh, a wearable biosensor to monitor vaginal discharge. So again, vaginal fluid, something that uh, we don't speak, and also women, we lose every day in our underwear, and we basically just don't know what it is. And there is no shame, neither to speak about or to don't know wha what is there, because actually there are also no data. So scientifically there are no data, and in the education we never, even our mother, like nobody really told us what is there, if it's pre-ovulation, pre after menstruation, pre-infection. So what are, we are trying to do is to make a, a, a circuit with a pH sensor that will detect the pH balance and trying to monitor and prevent uh, vaginal bacterial, vaginal um, or urinary inf urine infection. And um, doesn't go anymore. So
So you will be able, if you want to see this project also at the exhibition as a description, and it will be ready by uh, end of October. There is not any more, but uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Julia, it's really inspiring. You're really a citizen scientist, or you enable us to be one. Well, this is a conference about error, and we have an error now because our roof doesn't close. This means that we have to leave this room latest by one o'clock, we have to be on time. I'm very sorry about it, but we have to close this manually because it will be raining later on. So, we will shorten our time a bit, and I'd like to invite our next two speakers, the jury members from the Starts Prize, Sophie Lampata and Alexander Mankowski. Please, on stage, please welcome them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. take them. And Julia and Tim, can you come now? We have to shorten it. You're getting the short because version. Because I don't think it's raining, huh? if you look at this. Yeah, but some app says it's raining. It's about algorithms. The algorithms are a thunderstorm. Yes, so yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we two were in the jury. The jury was, was, was larger. We had, we had hundreds of projects to review. And we had made this decision then to make it, uh, we had two winners. And one was about collaboration in, in the center. You said that, hundreds of, of, yeah. of, of partners you have. And the other one was more about meaning and to give a message into society, yeah, to transport um, insight, in a way, more political stuff, and, and, the beauty, and, 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 and an, about beauty too. And an artist driving mm. the yeah. change, or the change yeah. of perception of the technology. Yeah. So to, uh, just to understand why these <laughs> two, two very, two projects, with, which are, but, but there is there's some, there's some, some bridge between, uh, bridge, uh, I think <laughs> it, uh, the bridge is beauty. Yeah, because beauty is always a, a way we think that is uh, misunderstood because you need that to, to, to give, bring messages into the society. Yeah, if there is no beauty, then it's not work. So, do you have a question for them first? And or something? The, the, you won the collaboration prize and uh, you mentioned before there were thousands of people involved almost. Uh, so, it's really, really impressive. Um, maybe can you speak a little bit about how you went about this, how you built that team and what the challenges were? Yeah, sure. Um, well, already when we had the ID, at, at the, f the first moment we had the ID, we realized that there was no way we could do this uh, by ourselves. So, uh, not just financially, because obviously a project like this is not, uh, it's, it's, it's not for free, you know, it's not, not cheap. So, uh, th there's a lot to develop and we are uh, just designers, uh, in a way. And uh, so we needed people that were smarter than us and uh, people that, that, that know from, from different, that, that know everything from, from different uh, uh, disciplines. And basically we, we looked at what we needed. We thought, okay, we need uh, robots. So we went to a robotics company. We thought we need uh, welding equipment. So we went to a welding uh, company. We need uh, software. We started developing our own software. And it kind of grew as we were going into it. And, and we were very lucky that uh, actually printing a bridge, uh, people really thought it was an inspiring ID. So that means that, that people were really willing to collaborate with us for, for different reasons. Um, some just for publicity, but most of them also kind of wanted to see what large-scale robotic 3D printing could bring in the future and what it could bring for, for their uh, line, line of work. So what, what, what does it mean for robotics? What does it mean for uh, welding future? What does it mean for, uh, you know, for, for, for... So your thing was to, to communicate the idea yeah. and then hope that people would uh, do something for it. Yeah, you. exactly. We had two options. When we, when we uh, came up with, with the technique, the, the, there was either the option of uh, keeping everything uh, to ourselves, mm -hmm. uh, file for a patent and, uh, and, then, uh, yeah. and then do so. something with it. But we figured that First of all, patenting is a very expensive hobby. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's expensive and, and yeah. you know, it's questionable how, how um, valuable it is. Mm -hmm. And we thought, you know, a project like this, you need to speed things up. So you need a lot of people on board. So we mm -hmm. did the exact opposite thing. We put everything online. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we post some YouTube and Vimeo videos and, and kind of 
try to gather people around us that could help us uh, bring this. So that's a good thing because we always look from, from a start user Jewish perspective on practices, best practices, so to say, that pe other people can replicate. Yeah, and to say yeah. this, what you are doing now is kind of a method. Hmm? Yeah, these very open yeah. innovation, so to say, and then get people into your circle and, and helping you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and then maybe next step we have, with it's so short with the time because it's not raining, but whatsoever. <laughs> and uh, so I want to ask you, because, because just, the, just the reason for everybody why we choose this, why another reason we choose this project, especially from, from the content side, is that uh, there is a large digital bubble around. Yeah, the digital bubble is out about uh, clean data, yeah, and, and so Rai Kurzweil style, we want to upload ourselves even cleaner and shiny and ach, everything is so immaterial, but in reality we are uh, bodies, yeah, bodies means we have exchange with our environment, bacteria, we are breathing in and out and uh, we are, we cannot go to Mars without changing ourselves into something else, yeah, because we are integrated in this environment and we thought this, your project was perfect to show that the body, most vulnerable part yeah, of the body especially, shows that we are not digital, we are biological, we are integrated in the world, as it is in these ancient bacteria, everything. So my question is, you talked about these taboos, it is a taboo, especially in the digital world, yeah, to talk about bodies, and you cannot up, you are not a neural network <laughs> and an algorithm. So. Uh, what are your experiences when you, when you touch this, t this taboo topic? Um, well, firstly, is that is, it's very difficult also to uh, try the language to, to express or to mm. work with a taboo, because if it's a taboo, it means that nobody wants to hear about yeah. it. So even the project at the beginning was very controversial. Mm. And um, there is a reason if uh, maybe even now it's, it's, uh, it, it, it got this prize. Because of course, like uh, even uh, from two years ago, there is a kind of uh, wave of feminism that is coming and uh, giving more awareness and empowering to women. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore they can feel more comfortable to speak about it. And also the wave of biohacking that from US mm -hmm. is starting now to come to Europe. And uh, uh, so really this awareness again on microorganisms, bacteria, and this mm -hmm. symbiosis that mm -hmm. we have constantly with them. Yeah. So, so this, this one is one, one path, your, fa your case was the idea, in your case it is to say, okay, it's technology and not a taboo. But isn't that a little bit cowardish because uh, it is a taboo? It's not technology. Um, yeah. Well, <laughs> the, the, the... When you said, yes, that your new project, need, it's, it's cunt, yeah? So it's, it's, it's taking it head on. Yes, well, the fact is this, why not to... Um, to to empower or to mm. give a reason to the taboo and to kind mm. of make awareness from the taboo with technology. So yeah, why okay. not use the media of technology? Why not to empower directly the woman mm. to use, in this case, biotechnology? Mm -hmm. So if now I can go in a biohack space and make a bacteria mm -hmm. and grow something, why not one day the woman can grow her own treatment mm -hmm. from, a, bacter from yeah. a bacteria point of view? It's a prevention. So why yeah. not she can really take care of herself? And then mm -hmm. you start to break the taboo because okay, you start yeah. to make a conversation. As a process. Huh? Yes. So, so you approached this as a kind of a speculative design project, right? Yes. Um, have you considered making this into reality, right? Uh, or how far are you from doing that? Or are you, do you have an interest in actually making it yeah. for us? Um, so the project started as a student project. And, uh, but I've been developing it with experts. So I've been developing it with biologists, uh, which uh, they confirmed that it could be possible. So uh, at that time, I didn't have time during the master because master is such a short period of, uh, of studying and, project and designing something that you don't have time to really kind of make it for real. And the interest was also always there to make it something happening. But then in these two years, by speaking about, I really realized that by now, women are not really ready to put bacteria in their underwear. Mm -hmm. Like, it's very difficult even to sell this idea. And so what we really need first is to really create the basics, so create an education. So this is why I, I enjoy to do lecturing about, because it's really the only way that you can make this education, because you can speak about, you can make people question, mm -hmm. hi, if it's really so, so easy, yeah, why not to use bacteria? If I'm made of bacteria, if I actually think, 
when I take antibiotic to replace bacteria in my gut, it's the same thing. Ah, the pill that I'm taking by mouth is probiotic. Yes, maybe I can also use them for, the, for, for my vaginal flora. So we really need to start more of this conversation and then possibly, why not, uh, it's coming in the market. And now, of course, with this uh, prize, the, the project will get an, an higher profile, so um, I'm waiting, let's see. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. we had a lot of women in the jury, and uh, for us, it, during the normal discussions, like, we would definitely try it. So I don't think we're that far. Mm. It, yeah, but because you, you, got, you got a complete understanding, because I think also when women, when I exhibiting, so this is weird, when I exhibit, women, they don't come immediately. So mm. they are a bit far because they see it kind of uh, too much. Like I'm, sh I'm showing legs, I'm showing underwear, mm. like why, you know? While sometimes men, they come and they ask me, oh, this will be good for my partner, for example. So you really need to, to, to create this boundary. But I guess, so this I, I still speak from two years ago. Mm. And generally, like recently, yeah, it's changing this behavior because I guess also in the surrounding there are more empowering women project or uh, in and, and in I think the conversation world. around the microbiome has become larger or more public mm. in general yes. so I think there is a better on. understanding yeah, of many, it. many people now start to think of that they are not what they think they are huh? <laughs> which is nice so uh, so I hope we, we can, can give you a platform to do that yeah with the, with the starts price and uh, now the thunderstorm, you see that, it's grey, it's coming down. Yeah, so uh, we have to leave now. But thank you very much again, yeah, for your contribution. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs>